It's my great pleasure to introduce our last speaker of the afternoon session, Professor John Bowers. Um, almost needs no introduction. <laughs> uh, John is director of the Institute for Energy Efficiency, as you all know from uh, this morning's introduction. He is distinguished professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at UC Santa Barbara and holds the uh, Fred Calvi Chair in Nanotechnology. And he's a, and he's a dis, um, and he received his MS and PhD degrees from Stanford University and worked at at and Bell Laboratories and Honeywell before joining UC Santa Barbara. Um, so John, I'd like to pass it over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rob. I hope you can hear me and the slides look okay. Yep, everything's great, thank you. Okay. So we've talked a lot today about this whole transition to higher and higher speeds and, and switches that go from you know 25 terabits to Certainly hundreds of terabits. We want to talk about how does that transition happen, and uh, clearly we're moving from pluggables towards two and a half D co-packaging. We saw a lot of pictures of that today to three D co-packaging, and eventually with lasers in integrated. So the exact time this occurs may vary, and obviously Chris suggested it, it may be further out than what's indicated here. But this, I think, is the trend. So the question is. Uh, what are the requirements in the optics to do this? So we're, we're moving from this situation of 100G with high amounts of power to obviously you know, 32 times the capacity uh, with much, much less power required. So I'll talk today about using rings, uh, arrays of rings to get high uh, capacity interconnects and using comb sources. And so I wanna talk a lot about the comb source, which obviously has to be integrated and compact and CMOS compatible. But it particularly has to be efficient. Uh, so uh, to achieve the, the goals of, of what's necessary. In terms of these large numbers of rings integrated and detectors and things integrated together, uh, just note that you know photonics really is evolving very quickly. And uh, in terms of number of devices being integrated, we're now you know above uh, 10,000 devices integrated together on a on a chip. And uh, whether it's, it's without a laser or with a laser, they're both progressing very rapidly. The case with the laser is maybe lagging by a couple of years. Um, but again, as shown here, there's lots of electronics companies that are pursuing this. So this is the focus of, of what we're doing to get terabit links. And uh, so again, we have arrays of rings uh, and typically 20 wavelengths per source. And uh, uh, we, we interleave we de-interleave and have two separate ones to get better um, suppression of, of adjacent noise. Um, but uh, the whole point of what we're focused on is having direct 3D bonding of the electronics to photonics. So there's very short connections between the driver and the uh, rings and so minimum capacitance uh, to get really low, low powers. And then interleaving and polarization multiplexing and so forth. And the receiver looks similar, except of course there's detectors on, on each of these rings. So we've worked closely with the uh, Luke Thigarajan's group at UCSB, did the EIC design and analog photonics did the PIC design is fabricated at SUNY. Um, and you can see here, this, this region is the very high density, very high data rate uh, pins. These pins out here are lower speed uh, thermal optic adjustments for the rings. These go away in, in the next generation a pick we're working on now. Um, but the point is that we can get very low capacitance, eight uh, femtojoule per bit. And then with all the packaging, our allowance is up to maybe 15 or 20 picojoule, femtojoule per bit. But um, this allows us to put most of the energy requirements into the laser rather than into the electronics or the, the rings. In terms of comb sources, I'll talk about two ways to do it. Uh, our focus in the first results I showed we're using modlock sources, and we're using quantum bat modlock sources for two reasons. One is the very high forward mixing coefficient means the different lines get locked together. And so even without a satchel absorber, you can get mode locking, and that I think will end up being the most efficient. And the second is the lower line with enhancement factor it means you have very reduced reflection sensitivity because most of these pick things, particularly with integrated lasers, don't have space for an isolator in there. Um, so here's an example. This is a, our spacing in this, in this uh, core system. 
the 60 gigahertz spacing, and we have 20, 20 lines now, 21 in the first demonstration where we were doing clock recovery. Um, but uh, the, the flatness here is within a couple of dB, and the total electrical power we need to generate this is only 140 milliwatts. So that's what lets us get to this half picojoule per bit. So Mario Dumont in particular, my group has been focused on, on how to optimize these MOLOC sources. And I don't want you to spend any time looking at this, but he's got very detailed models and measurements about how to maximize the bandwidth, how to maximize well plug efficiency and find the regions and designs that have maximum bandwidth. And, and so it's a very rich, very complicated subject, but uh, it's very interesting. So, that's one way to generate combs, these mode lock lasers. And that's what's been done for the longest time uh, in a variety of technologies. More recently, lots of groups are looking at nonlinear combs, typically Kerr combs from a variety of materials that are shown here. And uh, I'll show again an example of that. There's been a lot of progress. And in our case, we're focused on Kerr microcomb generation. It's very simple, just a DFB laser coupled to a high Q resonator, you can see an array of the, of the lasers and array of the modulators of, of the ring resonators here. But when you drive those again with modest amounts of power, you can get terahertz space combs, 40 gigahertz space combs. We've gone as low as, as you know, just a few gigahertz space combs. And what's really new here is that this is all this turnkey generation that when you turn the laser on, it always goes into the soliton, the quiet single soliton state. And that's what's been the real change over the last couple of years. That's illustrated here. Here's a slightly different example, but again, a bunch of comb lines where in this case, we've measured the fundamental line within each of them. And it's down, you know, basically around 10 Hertz fundamental line width. And, and the microwave phase noise is very, very low, minus 140 dBc per Hertz. So again, it's just very simple. It's just a DFB laser coupled to a resonator and you generate this comb of frequencies. So a lot simpler than having arrays of DFBs. We've integrated these together on a single uh, wafer. And so here's, again, if you look here, uh, arrays of DFB and DBR lasers coupled to arrays of, of high Q resonators. So we only need one of these for a given device, but we look through a lot of different splits here. And so again, that can be all integrated together to be very, very compact, right? Just a few millimeters on a side and generate 20 or 30 uh, wavelengths. So the, goal, the main thing of what I've been saying is that We've seen rapid improvement in silicon-based semiconductor lasers. So line was have been coming down over the last 30 years, but in particular with the use of silicon technology, silicon dioxide waveguides, silicon dioxide, silicon nitride, the losses are much, much lower. And since the line width goes like one over Q, the line widths get very small. So we're seeing fundamental line widths here of 40 millihertz, and in fact, integrated line widths of just one hertz. And so that's what's really exciting and a big change from what I think people are used to in the past. So the, the noise on, on a typical DFP laser is now being suppressed by about 70 dB. And so that makes it all much quieter and I think much more useful. So to summarize, um, you know, I think we're electronics, photonics, integrated circuits are, are converging, uh, certainly moving towards co-packaging, moving towards 3D integration. Uh, and using silicon photonics and by self-injection locking these lasers with high key resonators, we can reduce the laser noise. So if you're used, used to thinking about the DFP noise and line with the megahertz, that's, that's now reduced by a factor of 70 dB, uh, 10 million. Um, and again, uh, there's a lot of ways to generate laser combs for these arrays of rings, and they may be more like laser-based, they may be Kerr laser-based, um, and it means to be seen depending upon the the spacing of the chrome in particular. And what's shown here is the group that uh, I, I'm lucky to work with at UCSB. And uh, I wanna thank all the students here who did the work that I showed. So with that, I'd be glad to take questions. And maybe I'll just make one plea to all the presenters morning and afternoon. If you don't mind sending me your slides, uh, I'd love, love to collect, collect them and also indicate if they could be shared with others or not. And, as I get requests for slides, I'll, if you say it's okay, I'll send it out. Otherwise I'll keep it private. Thank you. Great. Thanks, thanks very much, Sean. Um, again, I encourage the uh, audience to enter your questions into the chat if you have any uh,
you have anything, I'm just scrolling down. I don't see anything right now. Maybe John, maybe I have a, I have a question for you, which is, so you, you made a really good case for the um, co-design of electronics and photonics, and it totally, it definitely makes a lot of sense. But how would you, how do you envisage that's consumed and when it's attached to other ASIC devices? I mean, do you see this as like a, it's a chiplet that gets integrated side by side, or is this natively the IO on the like the post ASIC would would transition into something that would directly drive the photonics? I think there's an evolution. So I think today, you know, most companies are using a discrete laser that's off, not integrated with the rest, partly for liability reasons, uh, partly for temperature reasons. But again, actually, I, I didn't get into this. We're making a lot of progress on temperature characteristics. So, you know, Intel has published 150 degree C CW lasing of their lasers. So, you know, there's no issue with the temperature of the chip at that point. And we just put on archive a paper where we were seeing, actually it's a Nexus photonic laser that we characterized, but we're seeing CW lasing up to 185 degrees C. And so uh, oh. I don't think temperature is the issue. I think it's more process compatibility and, and obviously Intel and HPE and Quintessent and Nexus and others are integrating lasers with PIX. And there are now foundries that are making that available. There was a recent announcement from Tower and, and Juniper um, on that. So I think we'll move to that. The only, you know, not everyone will move at the same rate, but obviously Intel is there today. And I think as things get more complex, as the data rates get higher, as you need more laser sources, then, then that will happen. And there was a comment earlier today about you know proportional energy use and and again the more lasers you have on chip the easier it is then to turn off all the lasers you're not using right and and uh, if they're coming from one power supply that's more difficult to do but if you've got you know 100 lasers across the chip you only turn on the ones that you actually need for at, at that point in time so i think for ultimate low energy consumption integrated lasers will be the solution okay Great. Well, that sounds really uh, that sounds really exciting. I'd love to have a laser that works up to 180 C. It would make a lot of this co-packaging much simpler. <laughs> Our thermal engineers would be very happy about that. Um, okay, so I see a question from Ram. Ram, do you do you want to come off mute and ask the question to John directly? Yeah, I just wanted to know more about the process challenge that John mentioned about uh, integrating electronics and photonics. There is a traditional well-known problem, but what are you specifically referring to? Sorry, the traditional what problem you said, Ram? I think any, any, there's a, always a challenge of photonics processes not being able to keep up with the latest electronic processes, right? Silicon processes. So I just wanted to understand this challenge you're referring to. So my assumption has always been that it'll be 3D combination of electronics and photonics. And so the, the latest five, seven nanometer, whatever electronics for the very highest speeds, you know, hundred gigabaud sorts of speeds, that's all one technology, but photonics doesn't need anything like that. And, and obviously the areas are larger. So the cost is sensitive. So I, I think, you know, living at 45 nanometers is all the photonics is ever going to need, right? From a alignment of the different elements and from the roughness of the, rings or whatever. Um, so I don't see photonics evolving beyond 45 nanometer technology and consequently the cost per unit area will be cheaper. And, and but electronics may indeed continue to evolve to finer nodes and lower power, higher speeds. Um, so I, I don't agree with the idea of, of having them all in the same chip, but I do think they've all need to be on silicon such that you can do three to millimeter wafer bonding, just like we saw with the the high density memory, right? High, and and uh, so, you know, all, we'll, we'll follow all those technologies and live off that packaging technology that's being developed for 3D electronics. It's just one of them will be photonic as some people showed earlier today. Got it, John. So you're primarily referring to the integration of, of these two areas. Yes. Okay. Yes. So just bump bonds, right? So, I mean, for us to get half peak joule per bit, it was essential to not even have through silicon vias, right? The capacitance for through silicon via was too high. So by flipping and having the just a copper bump bond between the EIC and the, the PIC allowed us to get much higher density. So our pad density is, you know, 26 microns. And, and uh, 
the capacitance is much lower than you get with the through silicon via. So uh, I think lower capacitance and direct drive from the transistor to the to the modulator is key. So the modulator is just a capacitor. It's not 15 ohm terminated. It's very small, very low capacitance. Um, so John, this is Ravi. Just one clarification. So in this case, when you did the 3D integration, you the photonics die has integrated laser, right? No, it does not. So we are using AIM photonics and we're working to integrate the laser into their platform. So our hope is within two years, we will have that. But in the results I showed today, it's a fiber coupled laser. Um, and again, the, the whole Moldock laser or the comb sources are evolving very, very quickly. Uh, so we've gone through many generations of devices in, in, in a given year. So it kind of helps at this point to have it separate. But you know, DARPA is sponsoring two programs, one with Tower and one with SUNY AIM to have integrated lasers with their PIC process. So I think we'll all have that access to that within two years. And, and it was wafer on wafer or chip on wafer bonding? So, well, they're doing, SUNY is doing two things. They're doing two and a half D, you know, where they solder a laser chip onto their PIC, but they're also doing epitaxial growth of quantum dot lasers on, uh, on their PIC. And so that's a much more complicated process integration because you've got all the PIC masks and levels, and then you've got the, the laser ones. Um, Tower is doing a, a bonded approach, so a heterogeneous integration. And so the epitaxial growth of the dots are separate. And, and uh, again, that's what Quintessent is, is doing as part of this LUMOS program uh, with Tower Semiconductor. Thank you.